Fito Perimá es por ejemplo, tu dieta no te da stop o por DVD 7 Art Series. Today we have a lady Diana Navarro. She is one of our most recent postdocs here at the EBD, and she is working at the somehow project with with Miguel Clavero uh, since November. So so I want to I want to welcome her a lot and thanks her for her talk. And she's going to tell us a little bit more about her background. Okay, so yes. I'll leave you talk. So good afternoon, everybody. Um, so I'll be talking about uh, restoration of complex ecosystems using rewilding, and for those of you that were in the, the Pint of Science talk some last month, uh, it's basically the same topic, but I promise you I put more uh, science uh, in those slides. But I wanted to start by introducing myself a little bit because I've been here since November, but with the COVID uh, regulation, it's just now that I'm starting to see most people without their masks, and I haven't had the chance to meet uh, many people yet. So. Um, you probably already noticed from my accent that I'm French. I actually uh, did my undergrad uh, in Paris and then uh, two masters there in conservation biology and another one in uh, ethno ethnoecology. I then moved to, to Lisbon uh, in the Faculty of Science where I did my PhD in conservation biology and this is when I started actually working on, uh, on rewilding. After that, I moved to, to Germany, to IDIV, uh, which is a research center in, uh, in Leipzig. Did a couple of postdocs, still working on rewilding, also interested in global, by the, uh, global change biology. And another thing that I did while I was there um, is that for four years I was coordinating uh, Geobomb, that's a, a global network uh, called the Group on Earth Observation Biodiversity Observation Network. And when I was doing this, I was focusing more on biodiversity monitoring, on the development of something called the essential biodiversity variables. And it's also then that I had the chance to, uh, to do some work at the science policy interface. And as mentioned, since, um, since November, I moved here uh, and I'm now working on the SUMHAL project. Uh, focusing on historical ecology and just very recently started to look into, uh, into citizen science. But I'm not going to talk about this uh, at all today. So back to the, to the main topic, which is uh, restoring complex ecosystems with rewilding. And I wanted to put things a little bit into context because um, maybe some of you, of you are not aware that restoration Ecology has been gaining some momentum in the past decade uh, in conservation policies globally, but also in Europe. This started, for instance, uh, back in 2010 when the, the CBD, the Convention on Biological Diversity, came up with a set of AICHI targets. Those are um, global conservation uh, targets. And one of them, AICHI Target 15, specifically addresses the restoration of ecosystems and their resilience. And it includes this, um, this quantitative part of the target, which is to restore at least 15% of degraded uh, ecosystems. A year after that, uh, something called the Bone Challenge was launched by the IUCN. And here the idea was to have countries uh, pledging uh, for, uh, for restoration. And the goal of this is to have um, 350 million hectares uh, globally that are restored by 2030. Some years after that, then now it's the UN that come up with a set of, uh, of uh, goals. Those are called the Sustainable Development Goals or the SDGs that you might have heard about. There are 17 of them and one specifically, SDG 15, is focusing on the conservation and the restoration of uh, life on Earth. Um, from 2015 to 2018, the IPAS, which is the Intergovernmental Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, uh, led um, an assessment on land degradation and restoration. I was actually one of the, the lucky uh, ones that was chosen to, to be a, an author in this assessment. Once uh, after the assessment was approved, actually, uh, the European Commission uh, brought up this EU Green Deal that you might have heard of that has a component that is the biodiversity strategy for 2030. And within this biodiversity strategy, there's also um, a nature restoration plan for the European Union. And last but not least, we are now since, uh, since last year, actually, we are in the, the United Nations decade uh, for ecosystem restoration. This was launched uh, shortly after the IPBES assessment was, uh, was approved. So I hope that I convince you that there's been some momentum uh, growing in the past decade for uh, restoration, but concretely what this means, for instance, if we take the example of this, uh, this target 15 of the, of the CBD, um, 
this is going to be translated also, this is a global uh, target, but it's going to be also translated at the, at the national level. And as of 2019, for instance, uh, there were 54 countries, 54 parties of the CBD that had designed um, national targets specifically for, uh, for restoration. Unfortunately, when the uh, Aichi targets were assessed back in 2020, target 15, like many others, uh, was assessed as not achieved. And the progress towards restoring those 15% of degraded land globally was uh, considered quite, quite limited. And in fact, if you look, this is the percentage of national targets that, have, that are considered as achieved. Green meaning that they have been achieved. There's just a little over 30% uh, of them, 30% of those targets, those 54 targets here that are, um, that are achieved. However, there's still some, some good news, or to speak, is that the assessment of this target allowed to identify some ambitious uh, restoration programs that are already underway in many regions. And rewilding is actually one of those uh, approaches to, to restoration considered ambitious that has been identified. So what is rewilding? Um, even though we're talking much more, I think, about rewilding in the past uh, five years or so, it's actually not that recent. Uh, we've been talking about rewilding since the late 1990s, and this is a concept that was first discussed in the US. And at the time, it was focusing mostly on what they call the three Cs, which are cores, corridors, and carnivores. And there's an interesting publication that came out uh, in 2005, still from uh, the United States. And, and, and the idea here was to uh, consider Pleistocene rewilding. So here, imagine that you're introducing uh, species to replace the functions that you've lost because of species that have gone extinct since the Pleistocene. So that would be, for instance, uh, reintroducing elephants because they can be functional equivalent of, of mammoth. Uh, and they can play a role in uh, creating and maintaining uh, open spaces. Um, and you can reintroduce lions uh, in, in the US, again, because, um, because of their role as uh, top predators. This was criticized a lot, but I, I think it's, it's quite an interesting uh, idea, provocative, but, but interesting. Um, there's other approaches to, to rewilding, of course. So the one I've been working on in my PhD, for instance, is completely different from this place to see rewilding. And here the idea was more to consider um, how we could um, benefit from the abandonment of farmland that we've been seeing a lot in Europe uh, for the past decades. And if there could be some kind of passive um, rewilding of those abandoned lands. Others have uh, proposed Again, slightly different approaches to rewilding, such as trophic rewilding, for instance, that is, again, thinking of the, the, the role, the functional role that species have in, in, in systems and also the interactions between those species. And more recently, we've also discussed, for instance, the role that uh, livestock uh, could play in, uh, in rewilding uh, programs. So many approaches, many definitions, that led, of course, to, to some confusion also, including confusion for people that wanted to implement rewilding directly uh, on the land. And so there's also been at the same time some, some publications criticizing uh, rewilding. Uh, for instance, this one that, that asks if rewilding might be just the new Pandora's box uh, for conservation. So having, hearing those criticisms, what we've been doing at the same time is also to, to, to rethink the definition of rewilding and how we could bring all those different approaches together um, and some more harmonizing uh, frameworks. And for instance, uh, last year, we, we published this, uh, this, this, this paper in conservation biology, and here we're discussing what could be guiding principles uh, for, for rewilding. So we propose a set of 10 uh, principles, but also acknowledging that rewilding is not black and white. So the rewilding ambition should be placed in a continuum of, of human modification in ecosystems, but also a continuum of naturalness and, uh, and remoteness. And prior to this publication, um, we had actually organized in, in IDIV a, a workshop where we wanted to bring together um, landscape ecologists, conservation biologists, restoration ecologists, specialists in, in ecosystem functioning. We wanted to discuss all those different approaches of rewilding to see if we could come up with a, with a, uh, a more unifying uh, definition and framework. And uh, this is what we did. So the definition we, we came up with is the following. Um, that rewilding is an approach to restoration that aims at restoring self-sustaining and complex ecosystems 
with uh, interlinked ecological processes that will promote and support each other. And at the same time, it should minimize or gradually reduce uh, human intervention. And together with this definition, uh, we identify three um, ecological processes that we consider essential uh, to rewilding and came up with this framework here um, to, to, to put those, uh, those processes together. So they are dispersal and connectivity, stochastic disturbances, and trophic complexity. And so imagine here that you have uh, this red pyramid here at the center of, uh, of the framework is your degraded state. And this uh, yellow uh, triangle here represents what would be the maximum potential uh, if you restore those three uh, processes. And so you can implement some rewilding actions that are basically going to push your system along the three axes of, of the framework. So you can restore dispersal and stochastic disturbances, but you cannot do everything either. So this is why we added another uh, dimension here, which is this dashed triangle, which represents the, the limit that is posed by society. So the, the acceptability uh, that society has for, uh, for rewilding. So that would be, for instance, uh, what is posed by human wildlife conflicts, uh, environmental risks that are posed, for instance, by, for, uh, by stochastic disturbances, but also uh, limitations that are caused by uh, linear infrastructure, um, so limitation to dispersal, for instance. And so I wanted to exemplify uh, this, uh, this framework, and I, I chose the example of, uh, of trophic complexity so to show you why this matters uh, when we're thinking about uh, restoration and rewilding. And the reason why we're talking about this is because clearly there, there's been a, a, a drastic reduction um, in the, the species richness of higher uh, trophic levels. So this is what is exemplified here. If you look at this, this part uh, of the figure, what you could see is the richness and distribution of uh, mega herbivore, large herbivores, and large carnivores in natural conditions. So this is without uh, human um, impact and human influence. On the left-hand side, this is the, the, the same thing, but this time uh, the actual uh, richness and distribution, which you can see is that clearly uh, most of large uh, carnivores and herbivores are now constrained to, to Africa and to, to, some, uh, to some extent in, uh, in Latin America as well. And you can imagine that when you lose those species, this will also have uh, impact, of course, uh, on ecosystems. So this is something that's sometimes referred to as uh, trophic downgrading. There's many, many examples uh, in the literature. Here I chose um, an example to illustrate uh, what happens when you lose um, large carnivores. So if you take a, a, this example here, for instance, this shows you that 60 years or so after the puma was uh, extirpated, extirpated from the system, you had a positive effect, a strong positive effect on the deer population, but at the same time, you also had decreased uh, negative impact on hardwood trees, the herpetal fauna, and butterflies as well. And so again, there's, there's many examples um, showing what is the impact of this trophic downgrading and, and defaunation. And so I hope I convinced you that this trophic complexity needs to be restored. Now the next question is how do we do that? Um, and it will depend actually on, on a couple of things. It will depend on the restoration baseline that we set ourselves, so how far back in time are we looking when we want to, to restore a system, but also the intensity of the intervention that we want to have uh, on the system. And so if you take, for instance, um, cases that are uh, a, a baseline that is not so far uh, back in time, you could have passive um, restoration and natural recolonization. One example, for instance, is the natural recolonization that the wolf did from Italy uh, towards France. It was absent for several centuries and now came back uh, in the 1960s. In other cases, these natural recolonizations are no longer possible, so we might need um, to do some uh, reintroduction. And in some cases, the species that you would want to have in your system is globally extinct, so now you have to think of a functional equivalent or an ecological replacement. Um, and the extreme of that is this example I gave you earlier of reintroducing elephants, for instance, to 
uh, play the role that Mammoth might have been playing in the, in the Pleistocene. But of course, you can also see that as we're moving along those two axes, we're also increasing our um, ecological uncertainty, so we're less and less sure of the impact that the species could have in the, in the ecosystem. And this also increases the, the chances of having um, conflicts, ecological conflicts, with uh, the local populations. And I'll discuss this uh, a little bit. But so, um, how to, how again to restore this trophic complexity aside from translocations and introduction or reintroductions, other approaches uh, could be population reinforcements, the designation of uh, no take zones, so for hunting and fishing, for instance, um, supplementary feeding as is done for, for vultures with vulture restaurants, uh, and the restoration of breeding sites. These are just examples, I'm sure we can think of, uh, of other approaches. <laughs> And thinking again of the other components of this framework, ways to restore uh, dispersal and connectivity could be the removal of some linear uh, infrastructure, dam removal, uh, or um, wildlife corridors, or wildlife passages, so which is exemplified here, but also um, with planting some hedgerows and woodland islands, uh, islets, for instance. And thinking of the restoration of stochastic disturbances, it could be the removal of, gra of grazing pressure, or on the other end, the support of grazing in some cases uh, for, for uh, fire regime regulation, for instance, as well as reflood, reflooding, and so on. Now, as I mentioned to you when I um, discussed this, this definition of rewilding, um, the important thing also is that those three processes, they don't act in silo, right? They're, they're interacting. And so this is what we're, we, we wanted to, um, to illustrate here. If you think, for instance, of a, of a highly modified and uh, anthropogenic system where you have, for instance, a pasture, um, crop field, and a plantation, you will have very limited uh, dispersal because of, of roads. Uh, you might have lost uh, in part of the system the top level of, of your trophic network because, uh, because of say, hunting, for instance. And the disturbances, well, they're still disturbance, but they're not stochastic anymore. They're not so, so, um, so random, and they happen to be, they're likely to be also more intense uh, because the natural disturbance regime has been, uh, has been suppressed. And so what happens is when this important disturbance happens, you're going to lose some species, which is represented by the empty circles there. And because of the way your system is and how those different processes have, are impacted, the recovery from the disturbance is going to be rather low. On the other hand, now if you take a, a rewilded system uh, where you've had um, the restoration of your stochastic reg uh, regime of disturbance, you have also uh, connectivity that has been restored in the system, and you have the complex uh, trophic networks. Well, now when those disturbances happen and they're they're random, but they're also uh, less intense, uh, your system is much more likely to um, to recover um, because it, it has a higher resilience. And so now back, back to this framework, uh, you might already be thinking that there's a big component that is missing from everything that I've been talking about uh, from the beginning. And this is the, the human dimension and the societal dimension of rewilding. So this is something that we've addressed as well. Um, and what we wanted to, to, to discuss is to which extent rewilding and the different rewilding actions could um, affect the contributions for nature, so uh, ecosystem services either uh, benefiting or causing a loss in the provision of those services. So we've um, here considered non-material, um, for instance, cultural um, contributions, regulating, and some material contributions. So think uh, uh, timber production, food production, and so on. And indeed, um, what, what comes up is that uh, rewilded areas, they, they can provide uh, a large range of services. So it's, of course, going to be different depending on, the, on the, the land management type. But if you think, for instance, uh, intensive agricultural areas, right, that's, that's where you will maximize your food production. Um, 
uh, plantation forests will likewise maximize timber and to some extent carbon sequestration. But rewilded areas, which are the darker, um, the darker shade in, in the back, can also provide a wide range of services such as water regulation, uh, soil and nutrient protection, for instance, habitat for diversity. And something that has been uh, gaining also momentum in the past years is recreation services. Uh, so think, for instance, of the development of uh, ecotourism, uh, wildlife watching, things like that, which um, in the case that I've been um, working on rewilding, which was when you have this abandonment of agriculture and rural depopulation, this is something really interesting because it's a way to redynamize some areas that have been abandoned, for instance, and brings new opportunity uh, for people to, to, to develop businesses uh, in, and continue living in those, uh, in those areas. So of course, uh, everything is not uh, always positive as you can imagine, and we also have to, to, to think of uh, the, the negative sides, potential negative sides. So uh, as I already mentioned, um, there's a, a high probability for human wildlife conflicts. So for instance, depredation from livestock when you have a comeback of, uh, of carnivores or damage caused to, to crop fields. So this is damage caused by uh, wild boars. There's also sometimes a uh, risk for human health uh, with increase when you have increased risk for, uh, for a fire or even uh, increased risk of um, zoonotic diseases. So this is the example of Lyme disease and the, the prevalence of the disease is likely to increase when you have more deers, for instance, an increase in deer population. But all those can be managed. Uh, there, there's a way to manage human wildlife conflicts, for, for instance, with uh, mitigation measures, such as fences. There's also some compensatory mechanism, financial compensations. Um, this can also be addressed and should be addressed with information and education. Um, and when it comes to, to those risks, one thing to consider also is that um, we want all processes to be restored, not just to have um, your, your deer population could increase, but should also be regulated uh, by trophic interactions, for instance, and, and, and dispersal and so on. So those conflicts exist, those risks exist, but they are also manageable. And this is something that is considered, of course, when we talk about rewilding. And I think it's particularly interesting to, to think about this uh, in the context of Europe, because um, we're talking, when we talk, for instance, about a wildlife comeback, we're talking about species that have been extirpated from areas for, for a very long time, for, for centuries sometimes. And we've lost the habit of cohabitating with those species. We've lost, uh, we, we do not know how to manage them. So this is our, our perception of wildlife, of nature, and what is natural has completely changed. And this is something called the, the shifting baseline syndrome. Sometimes it's referred to as the Little Red Riding Hood syndrome. And one good example for this is the story of, uh, of Bruno. I don't know if you know the story. So, so Bruno, he didn't have a happy ending, as you can um, see from this picture. Uh, he's an Italian bear. Um, and back in 2006, he started traveling out of, uh, of uh, Italy, went to Austria. And uh, his journey ended after six or eight weeks in, uh, in Germany, in Bavaria. He caused some damage, but nothing extraordinary. He uh, destroyed some beehives. I think he killed maybe a couple of, of sheep. Um, but the problem is that the, the German authorities, they didn't manage to, to catch him. They tried, but they weren't successful. So after a while, they just gave um, the green lights to hunters to uh, take care of him. And they were much more successful. And I, I think. What's really interesting also is the reaction of this um, uh, official from uh, the Environmental Ministry of, of Bavaria. And what he said is, it's not that we don't welcome bears in Bavaria, it's just that this one was not behaving properly. Whatever a wild species such as a bear behaving properly means. Uh, but I think it's a really good example of this, of this uh, shifting baseline syndrome and how our perception of change and how there's a lot of work and very interesting work that can be done on those uh, perception of wildlife, uh, particularly in Europe. So now I wanted to give you some examples uh, of how uh, this rewilding framework can be applied in uh, restored areas. So I've chosen three examples. Um, and for each of them, I, I use the, the figure of the rewilding framework, uh, so you can keep that in mind. So the, the red would be the, the starting point before 
uh, the management started and uh, yellow would represent the, the current state. So you have dispersal on the top, trophic complexity to the, to the left and stochastic disturbance to the right. And here the change in ecosystem services. So my first example is the, the Swiss National Park. Uh, this is the park that was established at the beginning of the 20th century. And the management plan for this park is strict non-intervention, so no management. Uh, there's no, or barely, there's no human uh, activities, so no hunting, no agriculture. Um, and the disturbance regime is also left uh, natural. This is also not managed. They uh, did some targeted reintroduction in the park to restore the trophic complexity. So for instance, ibex or bearded vulture. And what's really cool about this example is that they've been monitoring from the beginning. So we have information uh, on how um, a species richness, for instance, and distribution has been changing. And actually, so uh, species richness has increased. Uh, some population that were are almost extinct uh, in Switzerland, you can now find them uh, in this park. And there's actually been some sightings of wolves and bears. So they are not established, but they might become established uh, soon. Um, there's been some conflict with local population because red deer have caused damage to uh, agricultural fields that were outside the parks. But this has been managed with uh, some punctual um, hunting events that were organized together with the, the park authorities hunting outside the park. So this is managed. And what's also important is that um, this park has a substantial contribution to the region's economy because it, it attracts about 150,000 visitors uh, a year. So it's, it's also an important um, aspect of this park. My second example is the, the Tijuca uh, National Park in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. So this, this park is one of the last remnant of the Mata Atlantica, the Atlantic Forest, which is one of the most uh, endangered ecosystem. And one thing that you may be able to see from this picture is that the park is right in, it's really in the heart of the city. It's surrounded by the urban uh, fabric. And there's a lot of pressures on this park. There's uh, deforestation. There was also some hunting pressure. And as I mentioned, because it's in the middle of the, of the city, uh, connectivity is, of course, really low. It's, it's pretty isolated. Um, but this is a good example for the restoration of uh, trophic complexity uh, and disturbance, because this project 10 years ago, called Refauna, I believe, uh, started some reintroduction. Of, uh, of two species, the red humped agouti and the howler monkey. Those species, because we know their role as the seed dispersers and also um, indirectly impact the dynamic of dung beetle and uh, nutrient cycling. And this is exactly actually what they observed uh, less than 10 years after the, the program start. They observe improved seed dispersal, better nutrient uh, cycling, improved soil fertilization, and overall, uh, this, had, this introduction had a positive impact on the forest regeneration. Um, on the human side, it, it, they're not, there's not yet a strong connection between the park and the local populations. But they're working on that, so they're, they're training some uh, uh, locals to become um, guides for the park, and they've also uh, created some cooperative uh, and some restaurants with the idea to use traditional recipes and local products from the park. So it, this is work in progress, but they're working on creating this connection with, uh, with um, uh, local pop human populations. And my last example is the, um, what happened in, uh, in Chernobyl. Uh, and, and let's say it's, it's a good example of rewilding. Of course, obviously, it was completely uh, un unintentional, but y you probably all know uh, that at the end of the 80s, the, the Chernobyl uh, reactor uh, had a meltdown. And so this led to massive contamination of the entire area and, and, and also uh, migration of, uh, of human population uh, and evacuation of, the, of those local population. And this was followed a couple of years later by the breakdown of the, the Soviet bloc. And of course, this led to more um, migration of people, more uh, rural depopulation. So that led to large scale farmland abandonment. And so a few years after, um, after the meltdown incident, uh, they established a protected area, which has actually increased uh, ever since. And there's 
little to no management at all in this area. They have done some uh, reintroductions, so Bison's and Przewalski's horses that you can see here on this, uh, on this picture. And what's interesting, of course, I'm not going to talk about ecosystem services on the side of uh, uh, material and, and non-material one, for instance, but um, this region is really interesting now because it has all extant species of large uh, carnivores and uh, herbivores can be found now uh, European, sorry, uh, can be found in this, uh, in this, uh, in this park. So it's it, it's it's a really uh, interesting example. And I think we're still uh, learning more about it. So I wanted to to finish by discussing how we can measure this this progress in terms of uh, rewilding and how we can measure uh, the outcome. So I'm I'm switching to to. A work that was led by uh, my colleague Aurora Torres back in, in, in 2018. And what they did here is that they defined this, this bi-dimensional uh, space here that has on the one hand the human forcing on ecosystems and on the other hand ecological integrity. And so on this, on this, um, this plot here you can place uh, different uh, land managements or uh, for instance you would have Industrial agriculture, as you can imagine, has a maximum of human forcing and a minimum ecological integrity. And pristine areas, on the other hand, have maximized uh, integrity and low human forcing. And you can have the same uh, reasoning if you want to think of restoration, for instance, where you could have your initial state here and see how uh, your system is moving along this, uh, this rewilding score. And so with rewilding, what you want basically is to reduce the, um, the amount and the intensity of human pressure on your system, while at the same time you want to increase ecological integrity by uh, promoting natural values and the restoration of processes. So to, to quantify this, um, what they did is they, they uh, define, I think, some 19 uh, indicators. So some are indicators related to this human forcing. So what you want to minimize in an area, for instance, mining, hunting, fishing, um, and others relate more directly to the ecological integrity. So those are what you want to maximize. Um, connectivity, for instance, species com composition. And they contacted managers of different areas and calculated basically what would be the, the score for all those indicators and summed for the area before a rewilding or restoration project started and after. And so by doing this, you can see how your uh, rewilding score has changed through time. And this was uh, applied uh, much more recently to uh, seven areas in Europe that are managed by the Rewilding Europe Foundation. Uh, so this is just to give you an example of how this can be, uh, this can be applied. Um, in five of those areas, actually the rewilding score has increased in the last 10 years. Uh, the highest increase is in the, in the central Apennine region, where the increase is of uh, a little over 47 percent in uh, in 10 years. So this is this is one of the approaches uh, to to assess um, to to quantify uh, rewilding outcome in uh, in a managed area. And so for my last point, I wanted to bring actually this, this, this rewilding score, well, the different component of the rewilding score back to uh, those uh, ecosystem services and uh, nature's contribution to people, uh, but looking forward. So to see how we can put together rewilding, uh, restoration, and human well-being um, in scenario exercise. So what we did here is that we reviewed participatory scenario um, participatory scenarios in Europe. Uh, it actually covers 246 different uh, storylines or scenarios uh, in 18 countries and quantify to which extent um, nature's contribution to people were considered in those scenarios, but also to which extent the components of rewilding were considered. And so what you can see is that there's a higher consideration or incorporation of uh, nature's contribution to people in those scenarios uh, for the future of nature uh, in Europe. I forgot to mention, those are scenarios of land management and uh, restoration, uh, important point, for the, the coming decades. And uh, for instance, in particular, um, material contributions, so there's food provision and clean water provision, as well as uh, non-material contributions, so for instance, cultural services, are 
consistently considered throughout those, uh, those scenarios. Um, not so much when you look at the, at the rewilding uh, side. So um, there are some uh, consideration for increased connectivity and vegetation dynamics in the scenarios, but uh, not so much what could be the role of uh, natural disturbances, for instance, or what could be the role of uh, restored um, communities with large bodied species in the scenario. So um, they, they don't really take into account how uh, restoring this could contribute uh, to, to, um, to the storylines and, and, and to the future. So this, this is one of, of the things that uh, we discuss, is that there is still room to, to consider really uh, to recouple uh, uh, rewilding and the rewilding principles together with uh, human well-being, because we know those are connected, but in those exercises, for instance, looking forward, this is not yet done uh, consistently. So this is something else that we, that we are working on. And so to summarize some uh, take home messages, um, the first one is that as I showed you, or I hope I convinced you rewilding has been gaining momentum. And this is true both within the scientific community and also with uh, conservation practitioners. And there's also been increasing interest for rewilding in, uh, in policies, including uh, at the European level. Um, so we've proposed this, this uh, rewilding framework that is based on ecological theory and that uh, focuses on those interacting processes, which are uh, dispersal, um, trophic complexity, and uh, stochastic disturbance that beyond restoring uh, biodiversity and ecosystems and their processes, rewilding also has potential to contribute to increased human well-being. Uh, and this should better, be better integrated in future uh, landscape management uh, practices and projects, but also uh, in those scenario exercises. And that overall rewilding should be considered uh, alongside other restoration approaches uh, in the global strategy to address the the biodiversity crisis post 2020. And with that, uh, I, there's a lot of people that I have to thank for uh, all those years working on rewilding, but particularly those that participated in this workshop I mentioned in, uh, in Leipzig and some uh, additional people that I had the pleasure to collaborate with since then. Uh, but also I wanted to thank you for your attention and I'd be happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much, Latitia. So while the while the chat is warming up, uh, I would like you, I would like to ask you if you want to have, want to make any question to Latitia. Yes, please. Yeah. I was curious as to your opinion about the um, uh, introduction of Pleistocene uh, replacements. Like the, what is your opinion about that? If you have one. So I yeah I think this. Um, I found this idea of thinking of ecological replacement really interesting. And, and that's what first brought me to work on rewilding was that I wanted to go beyond for, um, restoration that would focus on species, individual species or specific habitat, but more thinking about the processes. And I think this thinking of the, the function that a species play rather than its identity is something I found really interesting. The problem with in my opinion with Pleistocene rewilding is it was so extreme I think it has shifted the conversation a bit towards um, something that is not necessarily feasible and achievable. And so maybe not so much now, but before when you were talking about rewilding, people said, oh yeah, you want to put elephants in the, in the Midwest. And no, I don't, but that's part of what people discuss. But I think, yeah, this shift, it has shifted the discussion and maybe we've lost some time um, because of that and detractors of rewilding they go directly to those examples which are it's not there's a lot more that's being discussed and a lot more that's being done so yeah I, I think it's really interesting but more as a thought exercise uh, yeah for for such extreme examples not something that can be done really thank you very much yeah thank you I mean it's kind of a dream, I suppose, for most of us to think about, you know, rewilding and very exciting area. But I'm a bit surprised you haven't mentioned climate change at all, because it seems to me that if you have a framework that doesn't take that into account, 
um, it doesn't seem very realistic to me because, you know, realistically we can't go back in time. Climate change is unstoppable now. Uh, global heating essentially is, uh, you know, the main, I suppose, the main um, dimension I'm thinking about. But, uh, you know, the only thing we can do is bend the curve, but we're not going to prevent a sort of average of two degrees increase this century. It's already over five degrees in, in extreme latitudes. So, you know, um, my question, I guess, is have you thought about that in terms of incorporating it in the framework and, and how to deal with that? Obviously a very complex issue, but I think if we don't include it, then the chances of success are greatly reduced. Yeah, so I, no, I, I agree, and I, I guess I should have mentioned it. So one thing also is that when we say rewilding, um, it's, it's to bring the wild back, but not necessarily having a time in mind. So we don't want to bring things back to how they were. 500 years ago or 5,000 years ago. So be, because specifically things have changed, including climate, so there are things you cannot uh, restore and, and, and maybe we wouldn't even want to. Um, however, uh, now rewilding can become relevant as a nature-based solution to mitigate the impact of, of climate change. So we do incorporate it, but more how rewilding can address it rather than, than, than how it would be limited by climate change because you could, you still would want to restore your ecosystem, and you still would want to restore those processes. So it, sure, yeah. yeah. But you have to think what is actually what species could realistically live there in fifty years' time. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So no, I agree. No. Thank you very much. Yes. <coughs> Thanks, Leticia. Yeah, I wanted uh, to deepen in the in the question of Andy that is how to uh, include in your framework, in your rewilding framework, uh, the effect uh, challenge of uh, global warming. For instance, uh, it seems that, uh, which presumably, that uh, uh, traffic relationships are going to be shifted. And also, the dispersal ability of, of species uh, differs at all. No? So for instance, to try to rewilding with a corridor mm -hmm. is not suitable for plants or for organisms that have low dispersal ability. So I think it's very important, the question that I uh, have introduced in Andy, and I don't know if you have other questions, especially for these dispersal abilities and traffic uh, scenarios that are going to differ. Do you mean how to better incorporate climate change and its effects in scenarios of? Yeah, it's, it's when you have to adopt any strategy for rewilding, you have to select, OK, I'm going to make corridor are going to make to protect micro site, micro environmental at the, at the spot, mm -hmm. at the local site. So that's a decision you have to, well, that the politicians or uh, have to, our scientists have to, to, to decide. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the, the question I want to, to have in mind for, for the discussion. Is, is it a question for me? I'm yeah, sorry. No, that's kind of for you. <laughs> <laughs> no, but no, no, but I, I agree. And, and again, I think on the hand side, I, I should have been more explicit on, 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 on the consideration for climate change in there, definitely. So I, I, I guess I agree with what you were saying, but I'm, I'm not sure if there was a question. Uh, Thank you. Sorry. Thanks. I didn't understand very well the association you made between rewilding and human well-being. Can you elabor elaborate that a yeah, little yeah, bit of further? Because the, the well-being people are dreaming of, it's a Western economy threatening um, thing, you know, which is quite uh, unsustainable. So, think, so the idea was, again, I, I, I'm going to go back to the context in which I, I, I started working on rewilding was that you would have on the one hand uh, farmland abandonment, so loss of uh, food production, timber production also in, in those areas that are depopulated. And often what I, what I would find with people discussing, okay, but if, if you have this abandonment, um, then what happened for, for people, right? How, how how do they benefit then for, from this land? And so that's why we started looking into how rewilding and your rewilded endpoints could contribute also to human well-being. So um, that's why we started looking at ecosystem services. Say a restored area included with rewilding uh, would provide more regulating services, for instance, soil protection, 
could be carbon sequestration, water regulation, and so on. But also some services more directly directed to uh, cultural services, for instance, uh, sense of place, uh, recreational services, say, yeah, ecotourism, the example I mentioned, for instance. So this, this was the connection that we were making, how, um, yeah, the, the process of rewilding and the restored area could also benefit uh, humans. And I've been juggling a bit between uh, the terms, yeah, human well-being, uh, ecosystem services, and nature contribution to people, uh, but those are all, uh, all related, yeah. Yeah, I have a, a question about uh, the services of the mm -hmm. ecosystems because to to sell a project to interest the, the policies with a, a project of conservation, you have to yeah to find some services that can be helpful for people. And I don't know, I'm I would like to have your opinions about this because, for example, in national parks, there are. A quite a lot of them, I think, that are victims of their success, like the recreation part of the service hmm. are impacting the, the park a lot. And I don't know, I heard about uh, policies in the park of the conservation uh, measures in the park that were going back on the recreation services because there was too much people that were damaging the, the hmm. park and things like that. So I'm like, uh, I don't know, some people think that uh, creating a national park is not always the best solution because you have like an, an enclosure space and a lot of people going to, to see the, the wild, like their perception of the, of the wild. And, and it's not always uh, functioning uh, on the point of view of, of uh, scientific uh, conservation. Like it impacts a lot uh, the, the ecosystem in the park. Hmm. So I don't know what you think about so that. So I'm not sure if I can directly address your your question, but what this this make me think is y you know this rewilding score that I showed with the set of 19 indicators. One thing we didn't get to do, and actually I'd, I'd be quite interesting in doing that, is to think of um, those indicators are more related to the the. Um, the biodiversity side of things. There are indicators about human forcing and also indicators on um, ecological integrity. And we're just starting to um, discuss how we can think of indicators also on the human side. So indicators yeah. uh, more related to um, ecosystem services uh, and human well-being to add this sort of um, yeah, second or maybe third dimension to the score. Uh, unfortunately, we. So it's still in the back of my head, but we, we haven't got that far. But I think that could address maybe um, what you're discussing. So to my knowledge, it hasn't been done yet. But uh, I think that would, yeah. that would be a way to address it. Because, of course, it's important to, to, to assess uh, how ecological integrity is changing and human pressure is changing. But you also would want to assess how um, ecosystem services are changing. I, I think there is a lot of pressure. There is a pressure of the climate change in these areas. And there is a pressure of the tourism. Mm. and uh, natural events sometimes and it's like difficult to manage uh, well the human part is really important no yeah. for a conservation project so i was wondering what is best an enclosure that is really closed and well protected but at the same time no mm. much uh, services for humans so it won't last maybe too long yeah, they have if to find the, the, the balance. Right? Yeah, the balance. Because uh, in, in, in the Brazilian example, for instance, it was, it was considered a problem that there was no um, um, emotional connection also between yeah. the people around the park and, and, the, and the park. So, yeah, it's, you have to yeah, find the balance. The balance between is difficult yeah. to find. <laughs> Hi, yeah, thank you for your talk and you have a really impressive background, so <laughs> that's really nice to see. Um, I think we are always talking about the same stuff with like the climate change and the economical system. And I think I was asking if you think that's possible, like rewilding and restoring like the ecosystem in the economical system that we are now, because the system is like increasing, increasing, increasing in more production mm -hmm. and this stuff goes like under the decreasing stuff and rewilding uh, things. And I think that goes really with the um, Western part of the world, 
like because you talk about services and mm. well-being and I think it's kind of tricky. Um, so I, I have two elements of response. W one is more aspirational, at the mm -hmm. end, not, not, uh, but the, the first part is uh, again in the, um, in, in the context that I started working on rewilding was this abandonment of, of, um, of agriculture in some areas. And uh, so that's particularly true in the northern es uh, hemisphere uh, in Europe since the end of World War II. What you see is that remote and mountainous areas, because they're, they're not very productive, they're not so competitive, they've been abandoned. So in, in some areas, for instance, where we had our field station in northern Portugal, you had a decrease of nearly, uh, I think, half of the, of the rural population had migrated in, in 50 years and maybe a third of the uh, cultivated areas was, was lost. Um, so in this case, there, there's not this conflict right, with, uh, with the economy anymore because these areas are, are abandoned. So this is one way, but, but then, yeah, of course that doesn't work everywhere. And this is where I'm getting a bit more uh, aspirational is that there's also a value in having this, this restored nature. It has, uh, for instance, positive impact on mental health. There are several studies that have showed that. So if you start putting a value on that as well, yeah, it's not monetary, but I think this is where also this nature contribution to people framework is interesting because it, it goes beyond putting uh, a monetary value on thing. Uh, you can start really seeing the, the benefits that we can get from, uh, from this, from, yeah, so. Thing. Did I answer your yeah, question? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And I have another one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you you talk about the risk in on in health in humans, mm -hmm. and I would think that rewilding will be the opposite. Like the risks are really tiny compared to like the benefits of like having a really well preserved ecosystem. I but so this is not my uh, human health is not really my my area of expertise. So. We have to acknowledge that there's an increased risk because if you have some species that come back or population size is increasing, then the risk of, for instance, zoonotic diseases will increase. But again, if those populations are regulated, if they're not exploding, maybe, yeah, you minimize this, uh, this risk. So, but yeah, that's not my expertise. Okay, thank you. Interest, but not expertise. Yeah. Thank you, Leticia. Very, very nice talk. I really enjoyed it. I wanted to ask you um, if you have thought how, um, how to incorporate in the, in the rewilding framework the fact that the most governments, at least in Europe or in the Western uh, part of the world, are transitioning more to our, towards uh, uh, renewable, uh, renewable energies and then mm -hmm. investing a lot in wind energy projects and solar power plants and so on, and how this might conflict uh, rewilding projects uh, or this, uh, yeah. So now that's, that's a really good question and I don't have a good answer for that, but it's true that when, um, we're looking at scenarios of uh, land use change for the, I think it was till 2040, uh, you could see an increase in abandonment. Uh, so again, on those remote and, and mountainous areas were likely to be abandoned from uh, release from agriculture pressure. So you, you could have a restoration, except in scenarios where uh, uh, biofuel, for instance, were, were very important or there was an increase in renewable energies. So um, all this to say, yes, uh, I'm aware that this is an a important point, but we haven't really addressed it. I think it's, I mean, I don't see it as necessarily incompatible, but... Yeah, the problem is that many of the areas that are being abandoned because of, yeah, they're not productive enough or they have low productivity, whatever, they are now being like pinpointed by some governments yeah. to, you know, areas where they could be uh, wind energy projects or in flat areas. Uh, we're mm. talking about mostly solar power plants. And at least yeah. in Spain, there's now a major investment of this kind of projects. And I, I, I mean, I see already conflicts with biodiversity, uh, farm, farmland biodiversity, for example. But I mm -hmm. guess in other areas uh, where some species might come back, we could have also that con yeah. conflict. So I think it's really interesting to keep this in mind because it's part of the climate, uh, climate change mitigation policies and so yeah. on. Yeah, no, no, um, you're right. Yeah, but yeah, of course, it's super difficult to project or predict where new projects will be 
uh, established, mm. but there are, of course, uh, plans of doing so. Yeah. No, no, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> but but happy to, I mean, yeah. I'm not an yeah, expert yeah. on this either, yeah. but happy to, to discuss more in the future. Mm. Thank you very much. So while the, the chat com comes with, uh, with more questions, I, I have one of my own. Yep. Uh, so one thing, I, I always get excited when I think of, of big mammals roaming over fields and everything. But at the same time, one thing that is bugging me a little bit with this rewilding thing is that what happens with this, with this term, the rewilding? Because when we think about th this becoming a keyword to look mm -hmm. for, and, and it seems that it leaves out the restoration keyword, right? Uh, and so when, when I see people asking about, hey, are they, are they including climate change in, in rewilding? Uh, I think that, that, I don't know, are we losing a, a, a part of theoretical advance that we have already created with, with the restoration keyword? How should we do about this? Like, yeah. Should we forget about restoration because rewilding is something forward or? Mm, now, uh, good question. And uh, actually, in, in, in the whole bunch of, of papers that came out criticizing rewilding, there were some saying, hey, this is restoration. Don't, don't. And, and it is restoration. I, I agree. It's just one form of restoration that the process of restoration is called rewilding because it focuses on A, B, and C, which is not always what's the focus of any uh, restoration approach. But it, yeah, it is important also to. In our definition, we were very careful to say it is an approach or it's a way of restoring. It's not, I don't remember how we said it exactly. But um, yeah, I consider it restoration ecology. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's not, I think it would be a mistake to rename restoration rewilding, definitely. But keeping in mind, it's one way of doing things. And, and what would be, I, I didn't, it's just that I didn't get, what would be the difference or the, or the characteristic? So this emphasis, separates. for instance, on restoring those three processes. Um, so when, maybe I can, I think I have a figure. As a difference to restoration. It's not the prettiest figure, I apologize, so this is an old one. But so that's when we, we, we did the, um, you remember this, this Aichi target I mentioned to restore 15% of degraded land. So we did the, we participated in the midterm assessment of this, uh, this target. And so we looked into restoration. We identified, you have different approaches. You have, um, for instance, you might have actions specific to restore highly degraded systems uh, or some that are focused, okay, we really want to restore this type of habitat or we really want to restore the supply of these types of service, of ecosystem services. Um, and so we didn't find this was capturing really uh, what, what rewilding could be. Um, I think maybe now this bubble would be pushed a little or might become bigger. Again, th this is an old figure. Um, but yeah, the, th there's different focuses and different approaches. And that's why I think it's useful also to have this, this other, um, other term. OK, so it will be a, a type of passive restoration. Yeah. but. Passive, also acknowledging that you, because I mentioned a lot of actions that, 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 that can be taken. So particularly in the beginning, you might need to have those, those interventions. But then ultimately what you want is to have minimal or no intervention, uh, which might not be always the, I see. the case. I see. Yeah. Thank you very much. We're, we are just reaching 2 o'clock. OK. In, and we don't have any more questions in the chat, nor here. We have one last question <laughs> from Duarte. I can follow up on this thing here. Not this so figure, I hope. As is uh, really more or less, it, it's related <laughs> oh, yeah? to... <laughs> <laughs> so I was wondering, you have this rewilding score. Yes. And as far as I understand, the, the, the higher the score, the more pristine is the system. Yes. But so you don't really want to get at this uh, pristine system, because we cannot, because, right? And mm -hmm. so what's really the goal in a rewilding project? And on the other hand, you have this, you know, for example, the Habitat Directive, which has a, a, a really specific goal of protecting specific habitats. Yep. So I was wondering uh, what's really the goal in a given rewilding project, how to integrate this, uh, you know, protection of specific habitats uh, and putting this in harmony with this passive restoration in rewilding. Kind of framework. So in my opinion, the goal is the restoration of self-sustainability of the system. So more the restoration of those processes and their yeah, self-sustainability rather than focusing on, on a given habitat and 
So I'd say that's, that's the goal. But then you don't have a, a good score for measuring that, or do you? Do you have a score for measuring, OK, you increased connectivity or you know, stochastic? Uh, yeah, I see what so you mean. The, the uh, complexity. Do you have a score for this it? part? Is not, yeah, yeah. So I, I'm going to go with no, but uh, <laughs> yeah. Another thing to think about. Actually, I wasn't involved in this work on the on the scoring, so, <laughs> so I, I I don't want to talk about something that I, I wasn't directly involved in. But I don't think it's included in the. Let me think. Yeah, w we can talk about it. But no, but that's that's a really good point, and I don't have a a good answer either. But yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Duarte, and thank Thanks. you very much, Leticia. Thank you for your questions. Also, that was really interesting. <laughs> Okay, thank you everyone for, for assisting, for watching us today and for watching us from online and see you next week here.